On behalf of the family of Clayton Sweeney, I would like to welcome you all to the Jackson Center for this celebration of Clayton's life. Born in Pittsburgh on October 20, 1931, Clayton A. Sweeney was the son of Reverend Dennis and Grace Sweeney and the brother to six sisters and one brother. That might have been difficult, I can imagine. <laughs> Clayton married his late wife, Sally Diamond, on October 4, 1958, and they raised six children during their 46 years of marriage, Sharon, Lori, Maureen, Clayton, Tara, and Megan. And he was the beloved papa of 10 grandchildren, Douglas, Ryan, Matt, Sarah, Thomas, Sophia, Dennis, Betsy, Liam, and Emma. He earned his undergraduate and law degrees from Duquesne University and was admitted to practice before the Bar of Pennsylvania and the United States Supreme Court. During his renowned career as a lawyer and business executive, Clayton was the partner at the law firm of Buchanan, Ingersoll, Rodewald, Kyle, and Berger, senior vice president of Allegheny Ludlam Industries, Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer of Allegheny International, Vice Chairman of Allegheny International, Partner, Managing Director, and Board Member of Dickey, McCamey, and Chicote, President of Sweeney, Metz, Fox, McGrain, and Shermer, and Partner at Schneider, Harrison, Siegel, and Lewis. He was a board member of the Board of Directors for Wilkinson Sword Comp Group, Landmark Savings and Loan Association, Liquid Air North America, Habuti Energy Company, Coppers Holding Company, Coppers Industry, Schaefer Manufacturing, Schaefer Marine, and Schaefer Equipment. He served as an adjunct professor at Duquesne University School of Law a lecturer at the Pennsylvania Bar Institute, and a member of the Procedural Rules Committee of the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. As a testament to his accomplishments, he was named a distinguished alumnus of the School of Law at Duquesne University, and he was named one of the 100 most distinguished living alumni by the Duquesne University Century Club. His professional career was matched by his distinguished record of community service. He generously served as chairman of the board of directors at Seton Hill College, St. Francis Medical Center, and DePaul University. And he served as a member of the board of a number of organizations, primarily focusing around church and youth. Both certainly was a theme throughout Clayton's life. After he relocated from Pittsburgh to Bemis Point, Clayton remained active by serving as the chairman of the board of directors of the American Red Cross of Southwestern New York, co-chair of the New York State Council of the American Red Cross, chairman of the Education Committee and Initiative at the Robert H. Jackson Center, chairman of the Bemis Bay Pops Foundation, and a member of the Jamestown Rotary Club. Clayton was an avid cyclist, choir member, Steelers fan, and maker of silly rules for his grandchildren to break. Most of all, Clayton loved spending time with family, friends in the Chautauqua Lake region. His love and generosity were deep and wide, and he will remain present through the many lives that he touched. I would now like to introduce Father Todd Remick, Our Lady of Lords Parish, for our opening prayer. Good and gracious God, we read in sacred scripture from Paul to the Romans, none of us lives for oneself and no one dies for oneself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So then whether we live or die, we are the Lord. 
God our Father, as we come here today to celebrate the life of Clayton Sweeney, we give you thanks for all the blessings and the gifts that you have given to him and helped us to see those gifts and share in those gifts and be part of him. We ask you in this moment to strengthen us and guide us, help us to move on and to be one with Clayton in spirit as he is with you now, Lord, and with his wife Sally in heaven. We ask you to continue to strengthen us and help us to follow in his footsteps as he served you so well in giving himself to his family, his community, and our world. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And it's my privilege, I, I am from Our Lady of, well, St. Mary of Lords now, but I, it is my privilege and my honor to introduce these love, this lovely choir. Uh, Clayton's first love and is, of course, the choir and his wife, Sally, when he always talked about how when they moved here full time, they looked and searched for a parish that they loved and they would like to be a part of. I would like to say it was Our Lady of Lourdes or St. Mary's in Mayville, but it wasn't. It was a parish noted as actually it was St. Isaac Joe's, now Christ our hope. And so it is my honor and privilege to introduce the choir from Christ our hope, St. Isaac Joe's site. <laughs> We are a portion of the choir. <laughs> we are very small, but um, the first time Clayton sang with us was at Easter time. So the song we chose to sing is kind of an Easter song. <clears throat>
You know, as this is a celebration of Clayton's life, I think a round of applause is appropriate. <laughs> that was wonderful. I would like to begin by just reading a short note from the chairman of the board of the Robert H. Jackson Center. On behalf of the board of directors of the Robert H. Jackson Center, may I extend to the family of our dear friend and colleague, Clayton Sweeney, our condolences. Clayton made a difference in his life at so many levels. At the Robert H. Jackson, he helped us advance the, at the Robert H. Jackson Center, he helped us advance the legacy of Robert H. Jackson by teaching the next generation that the rule of law is more powerful than the rule of the gun. He was a quiet professional who inspired us all with his smile, his sense of purpose, and his commitment to the law. We thank you for allowing us to have him in our lives. Clayton became a part of the Jackson Center family, I think in about 2007. But when he became really very, very active in the Jackson Center and our programmings and, and our programs, and in particular our education initiative, was in 2011. At that time, the center was joined by two dynamite young educators out of Springville that taught eighth grade social studies. And these two, two young student, two young teachers came to the Jackson Center <coughs> with a proposal on how to bring Jackson into the lives of students, starting at the middle school level and up to the high school level, and things that could be done. Clayton embraced that idea, and essentially in many respects took these two teachers under his wing, and between these two teachers, with Clayton's advice and mentorship, developed an incredible program that the Jackson Center is carrying forward into the middle schools and high schools uh, around the region, and as of late last year, even nationwide. And so I would next like very much to read a short little note from Drew Bider and Joe Carb, our education directors. As the Jackson Center looks back at its first 11 years, our thoughts turn to those who had a formative impact on the growth of the center. It was Clayton Sweeney who was the first one to embrace value, support, and the importance of education to the center's future. By being the primary benefactor of the, Jackson's, of the Jackson in the Classroom education initi initiatives since 2010, the center has been able to hold four major teacher conferences, launch a Robert H. Jackson Teacher Fellowship Program, promote a local and national Jackson Award for teaching justice, and create and promote lessons on Jackson, Nuremberg, and the importance of international law. It is safe to say that none of these initiatives would have happened without Clayton seeing the value and seeing and valuing the importance of teachers, learning, and how they affect our re region, nation, and world. On a personal level, Clayton filled our lives with joy friendship and confidence that we were doing that what we were doing was on the right track while he will be missed dearly his legacy will be a rich one touching the lives of students and their futures for generations to come with admiration and deep condolences to his family and friends present today joe bider and drew bider and joe carp i only had the pleasure of meeting clayton about a year and a half ago when I joined the Jackson Center in late 2012. But from my first arriving at the Jackson Center and having a chance to meet Clayton, get to know Clayton, get to share with Clayton and to enjoy his friendship, uh, I was immediately inspired by his commitment to educating the youth and his commitment to our programs moving forward to educating the youth. As Drew and Joe mentioned, this last year, the Jackson Center was able to have a National Teachers Award in partnership with the National Council of Social Studies, and that award was given in St. Louis. 
Clayton was there, was Clayton was there with us in spirit, although he was here. But it's because of the mentorship and the advice that Clayton has given on our education initiative that we were able to achieve that. And so uh, Clayton's support to the center has been immense, and we're here today in part because of Clayton. I uh, maybe possible a few personal recollections. I think the I think the uh, we would always find Clayton whenever you go to Bemis Point. You would find Clayton, of course, at the Italian Fisherman, and he had his table. And the center had uh, several dinners there, and of course Clayton was always a big part of that. But uh, but I do remember the first time that Clayton specifically took me outside, the Italian Fisherman and pointed down to the license plate on his car that was Lake Bung. Now I believe that license plate may have been partially responsible from his children. Does that sound right? That's, I believe it was his wife. Was it his wife? Okay. But you know, there were two times I was with Clayton, and I think he must have forgotten the first time that he'd showed me the plate. But he specifically took me out two times to show me this plate. And it was just, you know, and, and just such a joy and to see him light up when he talked about his lake bum plate and having that plate. Um, probably the other, the other time that I thought I saw Clayton lighten up the most was that um, at the International Humanitarian Law Dialogues, uh, one of the programs during the dialogues was the Clayton Sweeney porch sessions. And these were put together. At, uh, these were, Clayton was, was his idea and to sponsor these porch sessions. But at these porch sessions, we had students, high school students, that got to sit around in a very, very relaxed setting and meet international prosecutors. The people that they met, these were the prosecutors that um, are responsible for putting away the international war criminals that we have out there today. Brenda Hollis, Fatou Bensouta, the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, one of, certainly one of the most powerful women in the world. And these students got to sit down with her in a very intimate setting and talk to her about prosecuting war crimes and the impact that that's having. And, uh, you know, the, the, his enthusiasm with that program and seeing that happen both on a very, very personal level to up to the national award that we were able to achieve was, was truly inspiring. But uh, Clayton certainly has touched the lives of those of us here, of those of us here at the center, and of many, many school children in the region and now nationally because of what we're able to do at the national level. So again, um, it is our pleasure to host this celebration here today and to thank the family for giving Clayton Sweeney to us for the years that he was living in Bemis Point in this area and we very much appreciate that. I would now like to bring call forward Bill Tucker. Bill Tucker is the executive director of the Southwestern New York Red Cross chapter. Is that right? Good. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, you're, you're going to uh, see a bit of a theme here today. There are uh, those of us speaking, some of us have known Clayton for a long time, some of us have known Clayton only in the last three or five or ten years of his life. Uh, but many of us are associated with organizations that have values. And we know Clayton through his uh, commitment to those same values that our organizations represent. I'm here as the executive director of the Red Cross, but more importantly, I'm here because over the past several years, I had the opportunity to know Clayton and to truly uh, become a friend of Clayton. And I, I, I firmly believe that, um, as Jim mentioned, whether it was at the Italian Fishermen or uh, at our Rotary Club meetings or wherever it would be that you would run into uh, Clayton or the Lake Bum license plate uh, rolling down the road, uh, it was always a pleasure for, for all of us to meet him and to see him. Uh, to Tara and Maureen and Meg, uh, to your family that's here with you today, and to the entire Clayton Sweeney family, please know how much it means to all of us here in Chautauqua County and in southwestern New York 
to have the opportunity to tell all of you how very much Clayton has meant to us all. Um, if I could be so bold uh, as to speak for our entire community here in Chautauqua County in our area, uh, Clayton has meant so very much to us all. He was so important to so many people here and he will be very much missed and his absence will leave uh, without a doubt a large hole here in our community. But we take comfort as we hope you do in knowing that he did so much for so many that he was so giving of his knowledge and experience and that he was so generous with his heartfelt concern for others that his place in heaven as Father Remick so eloquently put it in his prayer has been unequivocally earned and reserved. We thank you for sharing him with us these past many years and for the opportunity to know and love this wonderful man. Now, for the past seven years, as I alluded to earlier, Clayton has been a wonderful supporter of our local Red Cross, which is an organization that strives to fulfill certain fundamental humanitarian objectives. And, uh, and we know that Clayton valued these same objectives. Humanity, impartiality, neutrality, independence, voluntary service. In a lot of ways, they align with the values that Jim spoke of. They align with the values of our Rotary Club and our four-way test uh, that Clayton was so committed to. Over the years during which I came to know Clayton well, I learned that he shared these ideals and that caring for others, especially those in need, was a true core value for Clayton. I would also add the values of community, loyalty, and civic responsibility to more fully develop the list of shared connections that we shared with Clayton. Connections which gave him a strong affinity to the groups that he supported, the organizations he supported, and to our local Red Cross. And of course, um, while I am sure those values did bring him, did play a large role in bringing him into our Red Cross, I'm sure the fact that his daughter Tara was a very dedicated and committed Red Cross volunteer for many years, I'm sure that had some influence on his uh, uh, desire to join our organization. And I'm sure the fact that uh, his very good friend, Vince Horrigan, whom he uh, respected very much who, and who was executive director at the time, had a lot to do with that. But that, uh, that describes Clayton. He knew people. He came to know those people. He knew the organizations that mattered in our community, that made differences, that mattered to him, and then he would um, join us and commit to those differences. It was through the Red Cross that I met Clayton that I came to know him and that I came to value him as a friend. He was a leadership volunteer, a board member, the board chairman, and the co-chair of our state council, as, uh, as Jim mentioned. I saw his professionalism in action many, many times over the past several years. As he presided over local and state meetings, I learned from him as he walked at age 80, the very, very long hallways and very, very steep stairs of our uh, New York State Capitol building in Albany. And I've always meant to ask Andy if there was not something they could do to, uh, to make those walks a little longer, uh, a little shorter, I mean, and a little easier. <laughs> He was on those long walks uh, because he was there to help our Red Cross, to help our local, local organization, to meet with uh, Assemblyman Andy Goodell and Senator Kathy Young and to uh, communicate to them just how important the organization he supported was to his neighbors and to the local community. He attended our annual meetings, our special events, and our recognition events. He rode his bike for 10 miles in what must have been 20 knots of wind one uh, sunny Saturday morning in June to raise money for our Red Cross. Never in any of these events or in any of these meetings was Clayton ever anything more than the consummate professional, the patient mentor, and the very extremely effective and productive leader. I learned from him as he told me during several long winter drives to Albany or Syracuse, the stories of his youth the work he had done uh, in steel mills before, uh, I believe it was before he went to college, it may have been um, before and after he went to college. His service in our nation's military and his experiences as a lawyer and as a businessman. 
But mostly, and this is absolutely the truth, at the beginning and end of every long conversation, Clayton was talking about his family. Uh, and he was talking with uh, un, un, uh, without a doubt. I mean, there was no doubt about the pride he had in his voice when he talked about uh, what his family was doing. Um, whether it was his daughters and his son, uh, his daughter's professional work in, in universities and his doctors, uh, whether it was about the colleges and universities that his grandchildren or his grandnieces or his grandnephews were about to attend, um, whether it was about a certain adventure that had to do with an Irish dance performance, um, usually involving, I think, a snowy uh, trip uh, to Pennsylvania or somewhere far away with, with, with dangerous conditions that he, that he was concerned about. Um, the joys of the summer visits um, were a frequent topic of conversation and Thanksgiving and what had happened and who was coming and, and he could give me the litany of uh, the long, long list of, of all who were attending on those, those, those many times. There is no doubt that Clayton is loved by his family, is loved by all of us here in his Chautauqua County home. Uh, and there's no doubt that he loves his family and that he loves us all. For all of us, Clayton, for all that you taught us, for all that you taught me and showed me, for your positive influence on our society, on our community, and on our neighbors, especially for your leadership, I thank you and will be eternally grateful that I had the chance to know you and to celebrate your life. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Vince Horrigan, good friend, Chautauqua County Executive, and uh, Rotary Club member. Thanks, Bill. Good job. The stories will continue. Um, I first uh, met Clayton when a friend of mine, who you will speak later, said that Clayton Sweeney just might be a good board member for the American Red Cross. And so another board member that was there from Pittsburgh, John Turner, we strategized and said we need to see if we can't recruit this Pittsburgh attorney who is now living up here full time. He says, yes, I'm on board. I'm from Pittsburgh. Actually, I know Clayton Sweeney. He's, he's very well known in the Pittsburgh area. So he said, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm, I, I have this letter written and I'm going to go down and knock on the door and hand deliver it. I said, that's great, John. You'll have to excuse my, uh, my nose here when I get a little emotional. It kind of runs. But anyway, so the next thing I know, I, I know he's headed down to see Clayton. And five minutes later, he's in front of in my driveway. I said, John, what happened? He said, I can't do this. I said, why not? He said, I pulled in the driveway. And on the back of his bumper is Gore Edwards. He's a Democrat. I can't do it. <laughs> I said, all right, give this to me, John. I will go do this. But needless to be said, we, we ignored the bumper sticker, and uh, Clayton became a great friend. He said, yes, I happen to have the time, and I'm, and I'm ready to help and serve. That was my affiliation at the beginning. And of course, whether it was the Jackson Center uh, whether it was the Red Cross and the Rotary Club of Jamestown, that's where we got to experience exactly what Bill was talking about. The motto of the Rotary Club is service above self. And Sharon Hamilton, our president, asked me to say a few words as a fellow Rotarian. I did sponsor Clayton into our Rotary Club. He had known, of course, about Rotary and community service. And he never had the chance to join, so he was proud to join. And very quickly, early on, uh, when he quickly became, became someone who embraced the ideals and principles of Rotary, I remember the day that, of course, being generous in so many ways, he sponsored the first Paul Harris Fellow, Paul Harris being the founder of Rotary over 100 years ago as a vocational service club. 
and we awarded um, Clayton that Paul Harris pin. And big surprise, we had his daughter Tara come down from, uh, from Buffalo, and it was a big surprise, highly classified, and as I met Clayton at the door, he said, hey, is Tara here yet? <laughs> he said, I have, I have informers. But that was the first um, really understanding of Clayton and his, his service to Rotary. You know, this is the kind of person he was. He, he made another sizable donation to the Paul Harris Club, and he said, you know, I said, who would you like to honor for that? He said, you know, there's somebody in our midst, in our club, in our community that, that hasn't really had the recognition I think he deserves. And, and many may know him, Lou Meckley. Lou does an awful lot in this community. He said, I want Lou Meckley to be honored, and I want to sponsor that. He, that's the kind of guy Clayton was. Clayton would find that person out there who he felt was contributing, not Clayton, but someone else that needed that recognition, and I always remember that. Unfortunately, the Meckleys are out of town, but it was uh, really an incredible, incredible act, and that's who Clayton was. In our Rotary Clubs, we always had our auction, our fundraisers, and Clayton always was there, of course, bidding on interesting things, and you know what he typically always did? He went for the dinners, because what he wanted to do was have his friends over, whether it was on a boat or uh, in his house, he wanted to bring everybody in, where we came together as Rotarians, uh, together and social, and just celebrated fun. And that's what Clayton was all about. He, um, his declining health towards the end prevented him from attending many Rotary meetings. He felt bad about that, but he always wanted to catch up uh, on everything that was going on. Now, I'm speaking on behalf of Rotary, but I would be remiss if I didn't tell you a little bit about another very special club. It was called the Friday Night Dinner Group. The Friday Night Dinner Group was just a bunch of us that would go out for dinner on Friday night. And of course, Clayton was invited to be part of that, that fun time. And that's where we heard all the stories. We heard them all about family. We heard about the Irish Mafia in Pittsburgh. We heard them all, and they were fun. And last night, as a matter of fact, uh, we went to a place we'd, we'd been to many times, and the person said, the usual seven? No, just six tonight. But Clayton was always there telling us his stories. Stories like, let me tell you the time I was down in Celeron, and I got stopped by the police. Oh, really? Tell me about that, Clayton. What happened? He said, well, you know, I'm an attorney, and I had to have a good story, so I was going a little fast down Lucy Lane. I was showing my granddaughter, Sophia, where Lucy Arnez, where Lucille Ball lived. And I was going a little fast, so the policeman came up to the window and said, Sir, you're going a little fast. What's going on? He said, Well, I wanted to show my granddaughter where Lucy lives. He said, Well, just slow down, sir. And with that, Clayton said, Boy, that was a close one. And his daughter, Sophia, said, Papa, you just have an aura about yourself. <laughs> We heard that story 20 times, but it never got old. Yes, he was the late bum, and uh, that was a story. Um, he went to the Italian fisherman one or two times, but he really went to the hare and hounds a bunch. I remember uh, one of our Friday night dinner group who will go unnamed. Sylvia said that uh, she had the opportunity to go out to dinner with Clayton and, and when he picked her up, hello, love, and she said it was just wonderful. You know, he would call me love till we got into the hare and hounds and sat down, and I noticed he called every woman love. <laughs> he said to me many times, he says, I don't know what it is. Anywhere I go, the young girls come up and hug me and give me a kiss. He says, I don't think it's sexual, do you? <laughs> no, no, Clayton, it's... It's out, sorry, Father, it's just out of respect. We, ha we had a lot of fun with Clayton, and um, he, his whole approach to everything in Bemis was true love. You know, through his career, professional career, you could see he had some very high-level positions. He did international negotiations at every level. But one of the negotiations he was most proud of was right here in Bemis Point. 
Um, in addition to the Lake Bum license plate, he had two, two boats. One was the, the ski boat, nicknamed the Gnarly Winch, I think probably by the kids, I'm not sure. And the other was the Wimpy Winch, that was a pontoon boat, okay? <laughs> So uh, it, as time went on, he realized we didn't use the wimpy winch so much, so he called me and said, I struck a great deal with Jenna Head. Here's the deal. They've got the pontoon boat, and my dock will be taken care of for the rest of my life. Isn't that cool? I said, well, Clayton, I don't, that thing was worth some money. He goes, that's okay. The money they charged me to take my dock out, this was a home run. <laughs> so at any rate... Jenna, I don't know, but he was so proud of that negotiation. He thinks he got the best of the deal. Um, I want to I finish with a little story about another negotiation. Um, Father was talking about St. Mary's and Our Lady of Lourdes and Christ Our Hope. And over the last um, several years, the parishes in western New York there it is again, sorry. Western New York uh, had to do a consolidation, and I was on that consolidation team. Very, very difficult. As you all know, when you consolidate parishes or communities or villages. And at uh, any rate, it was a difficult time. Difficult not only for the group, but for me personally. We had, I had some very close friends over in Sherman, and we had to finally come up with a decision on, on how we were going to do the masses and everything. And so I had a plan. I was there to speak to it. I could feel the tension between um, my very good friends. And so we're all set. I'm, I'm going to give this. I'm on a podium like this, and the whole group is out there. And I know it's going to be a difficult session. Clayton, meanwhile, I was working for Clayton. He was chairman of the board of the Red Cross, very generous donor. And right before we start, there's one empty seat right there. And uh, right before I begin, the door op opens, and in walks Clayton Sweeney and sits right there. Now, he is a member of that church. And, and I said, hi, Clayton. He goes, I came to hear your presentation. I know you'll do the right thing. <laughs> I came back. Denise, that wasn't fair. And I said, I have a slight adjustment to the, to the, to the whole thing. And, you know, St. Isaac's, you're going to get what you want. He said, I thought so. <laughs> That's really true. We did our final presentation to the diocese, and there was this sweet little nun that came. She was the bishop's representative. We all thought she was very sweet. Clayton was our lead negotiator. We're all behind him. Clayton, tell him. Don't mess with our community. We know what we're doing. So we're all cheering on, and my sister says, okay, Mr. Sweeney, what would you like to say? And he says, sister, we are self-sufficient. We have the money. We know what we're doing. We're a vibrant parish. And sister, if it doesn't itch, don't scratch it. And we're going, yeah, that's a home run. And little sister, she leans forward, and she leans right at him and said, Mr. Sweeney, it's been itching for a long time. <laughs> Clayton, the only time he backed up a little bit. But at the end of the day, our parish got what we want. I really thank the family, everybody that's here. We were down in Pittsburgh, and Deacon Fritz gave an incredible homily um, that was truly remarkable and talked about a very busy man a man with tremendous responsibilities and family and love. And right up until the last couple of days, Clayton was there. He told me, I've got to get out of this hospital because I can help you in your role as the county executive. And that's the kind of guy he was. We're very fortunate to have Clayton in our community and personally a great friend, a great mentor, and, uh, and I miss him. This time I'd like to ask Denise Burby from Christ Our Hope to come over. Thank you. This is kind of a challenge since I share a lot of the same stories and had the pleasure of introducing Clayton to Vince. But I think what I'll do instead of uh, starting out with some other stories, we're going to start with a poem. 
written by Meredith Kenyon from Christ Our Hope Parish, or Christ Our Hope Church. There once was a man named Clayton. He loved to watch Ben, not Peyton. A better man you couldn't find, generous heart, soul, and mind. Sally's sure glad she's done waiting. <laughs> Clayton lived in such a way that it's difficult to express his impact in just a few moments. Um, as his friends at St. Isaac Joe's sat around and discussed our memories of him, we, like so many of you, were caught up in a lot of moments and laughter and tears. Something that really struck me was when one person said, you know, he chose us. And it's strange to think about that. Here's a successful, powerful man from a big city choosing us, this little old church between the post office and the library in Sherman, New York. When we first moved here, we didn't even know if Sherman had a Catholic church, but they do. And Christ Our Hope takes on the full meaning of small but mighty. And in so many ways, it was the perfect fit for a man like Clayton. He was quiet but strong. He never was one to push or interject, yet his professionalism, dignity, and respect for the church were always quite clear. Even, he even chose us when his first experiences with St. Isaac Joe's were a bit bumpy. One Good Friday service several years ago, <laughs> I think Tara was there, <laughs> a couple of you, uh, Sally, Clayton and the family were sitting in front of us like they often did. You know, that's that unwritten assigned seating thing that you have in churches. Well, as the service began, the priests started to process down the aisle along with the altar server carrying the cross. The cross was a handmade cross that we used for decorations in the church, and it was made out of one by eight rough cut lumber. Now this was a big cross, and it was a little altar server. <laughs> So as the priest started to process down, the cross came, went right over the head of my husband Mike and I, and whacked Clayton <laughs> smack in the back of the head. A lot of people got to know Clayton that day. But even after that bump on the head, he still chose to come back to St. Isaac Joe's. There are so many stories and so many memories that we all have of Clayton at St. Isaac Joe's the way he and Sally always held hands after the Lord's Prayer, the way he always gave me a hug and a kiss at the sign of peace, how he did the same with Meredith as he met the Kenyans and watched their family grow and they sat in front of him. Um, we remember Clayton joining his first choir in Sherman in his 70s and then singing the Easter proclamation with Mike Gelivo for a couple of years. We remember him in his service at Christ Our Hope Parish as the member of the Finance Committee, and also as the designated cobweb cleaner for St. <laughs> Isaac Joe's. For many years, he was the only one tall enough to take the cobweb duster and reach the peak of the church. But you know, Clayton wasn't always the one who did all the choosing. There were times, a few times, when the choice was ours, like one Sunday when if you've ever been at St. Isaac's after a Mass, um, nobody tends to leave. Pretty much the church, half of the church stays there for about another hour chatting and having fun. Well, this Sunday, the discussion had turned to what are we going to do for the 4th of July, and we think we should have a party. So the members of the parish decided to choose Clayton as the host. <laughs> and of course, Clayton gladly accepted. So about 30 or 40 people descended on the Sweeney compound for the 4th of July and had a wonderful, wonderful time. Clayton always shared his family with us, and he shared us with his family. And I think that's why it was such a perfect fit for Clayton and Sally at St. Isaac's. It was all about family. You know, there are many more memories we could share as we all got to know this amazing person. And that chose to celebrate each Sunday with us. The stories and sentiments I share today are, you know, not only mine, but are all of those, at, all from all of us at St. Isaac's, and they were beautifully woven together by Meredith Kenyon. Clayton was a great person, and he chose to be a great person. I think choice is the word that I find most compelling about Clayton. 
There are many words appropriate for this man, yes. Kind, generous, successful, mentor, friend, stealers, cyclist, volunteer, charitable, Irish, and the list goes on. But the word choice, that's the word that compels me. This is the word I'm going to remember when I reflect on Clayton Sweeney. Our world has begun to think of throwing things like accountability and responsibility to the wayside, and that's the way of it. Governments, financial institutions, schools, media, corporations, parents, spouses, we see it over and over again, examples of throwing away accountability and responsibility. Clayton chose differently. He was a steward of accountability and responsibility. Clayton chose to work, supporting a growing family, putting himself through school. Clayton chose to give hours and hours of financial contributions to organizations that he felt would improve the world. Clayton chose to support the Jackson Center, the Bemis Bay Pops, the Red Cross. Clayton chose to show the power and the goodness of the Catholic Church. Clayton chose to show his grandchildren the power and value of an education. Clayton chose to share his life with a corner of Chautauqua County and we're all better for it. Clayton chose to live a life that mattered, a life that improved the lives of many. Clayton, the lake bum, was anything but a bum. He chose to sing, he chose to give, he chose to lead, he chose faith, he chose family. May we have the strength and fortitude that Clayton had. May we live lives that teach each other the power of good choices. And we, may we all learn from this amazing man. Thanks. It is at this time that we would like to open the floor to anyone that might have a few things that they would like to say about Clayton. Please uh, come down or uh, stay where you are and we'll bring you a microphone, whatever you would like to do. Is there anyone that would like to say a few words? I wasn't going to speak, and they weren't going to give me a microphone. <laughs> um, but I wanted to share one story. I have to tell you, Clayton really put me on the spot. Um, and it wasn't the fact that he was a Democrat and proud of it, <laughs> even though I'm a Republican. And now that he's passed, I think I can let you know that he actually contributed to my campaign. I think that <laughs> that vow of secrecy is gone. <laughs> uh, it actually related um, to a Rotary event. And um, Lisa, my wife, uh, and I put up our boat, and we had offered at the Rotary uh, auction to take a group of four guests on our boat for a ride to the Italian fisherman for dinner. And uh, Todd Allen, who's here, uh, agreed to help us as a host. And um, the bidding started then, and Clayton was bidding on it, and he said, well, can we take more than four? I said, well, we talked about it, and we said, yeah, we can go up to six. And uh, Clayton won. And um, as we we're scheduling it and working on it, the list kept going longer. <laughs> You know, we started at four, we were at six, and we were at eight, and, and then we started going above that. And um, this really put me in an awkward spot because uh, my boat is, is, is licensed for only a certain number of people, and we were <laughs> going beyond that license number. And normally I wouldn't worry about it, but in a previous Rotary boat trip, I had been stopped and had a free inspection. <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
You know, uh, it's, it's awkward if you pretend to be a lawmaker, if they portray you as a lawbreaker. <laughs> and um, so this was getting very, very awkward. And um, I reached out to, to Vince, who was a great friend of, uh, of Clayton and, um, and, and Barb, and said, you know, I'm a little bit in an awkward spot here. Um, so let me tell you what happened. We ended up with a lot more people than could fit on my boat. <laughs> and, but all of Clayton's guests rode on the boat and enjoyed the moonlit cruise back. And Clayton met us at the restaurant, which says a lot. Thanks. Anyone else that would like to say a few words? Oh, please, yes. <coughs> Got here late, so I'm going to stop. Um, I just wanted to say I met Clayton. Um, I'm a friend from St. Isaac Jokes, uh, Christ Our Hope. I met Clayton at the Italian Fisherman when I was a waitress. And... Um, the cool thing about getting to meet Clayton at the time of my life when I did was God really wanted Clayton and I to cross paths because I lived in Jamestown and I worked at the Italian Fisherman and Mr. Sweeney, Mr. Sweeney's here, everybody got excited and I'm a big fan of musicals and I always felt like it was like Dolly was here. <laughs> Dolly, 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 Mr. Sweeney, Mr. Sweeney. And so I met uh, Clayton then as a waitress and I was a waitress and I was in grad school and I wanted to become an English professor and he was this great person that, you know, oh, you can do it and lo and behold, a couple years later, I became an English professor and um, I moved to Sherman so that I could be closer to Penn State Barron and with my husband um, and I start going to church in Sherman and there's Mr. Sweeney and I was like, Mr. Sweeney, what are you doing? Can I get you some water? Like, <laughs> what's going on? Why are you in this little church? <laughs> Um, you know, he's like, oh, this isn't my church. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. And so I already knew some of his grandkids because they had also worked at the Italian Fisherman. And I can't really look at him right now because they're so much more grown up <laughs> than when I first met them um, and brought them mussels because they really like to eat mussels. Like, I remember what they like to eat. <laughs> but um, what I wanted to say about Clayton was a couple of things. I met him as a waitress, and he's this really powerful person, and years later we find out, you know, he had a jet and he flew around the world, and he's friends with assemblymen and all the directors of organizations that are really important, and he totally knew how to be really cool friends with a waitress. Um, and that's my favorite thing about Clayton, is so many of you are really important um, people, and um, some of us are not really important people, and he made everybody feel really important. Um, because he believed in that humanitarian value that every person is really important. Um, and, you know, I, I, I got the job that I wanted, and Clayton was there to watch me bring my kids into the world, not at the hospital, but at the church. <laughs> um, and so I have an outfit at home that when, when I had my son, my first baby, I was one of those moms who had a terrible transition period. I met Tara at the picnic that we invited ourselves to, and Tara lovingly talked to me the entire time when I was like, nursing is kicking my butt and I'm not sleeping and I, I don't, what am I going to do with this baby? And anybody who talked to me in the first six months of Parker's life, that's the story they heard was, nursing's kicking my butt and I'm not sleeping. And Tara, that was the first time she met me and she lovingly talked to me the whole time and she pointed at Liam and Betsy and Emma and she was like, this is what you're going to get. And I was like, do you promise because your kids are really beautiful? <laughs> and she was like, yeah, it's hard, but you're going to get this. And, um, and so I, you know, I have that first outfit. When Parker was born, Clayton came to church and he bought me a shower gift. And he bought an outfit that was green. And I still have it. And Aurora wore it this summer. And I will always keep that outfit because here's this man who, you know, met me as a waitress and started to give me the high love and the kiss at the handshake of peace. And I thought I'd really made it. Clayton's kissing me <laughs> at the handshake of peace. And um, I was so sad to hear that he had passed away because... There are not many people in the world that are capable of making everybody that they meet feel important. 
So many of us make other people feel lousy. Not intentionally always, but sometimes intentionally. And, and Clayton never did that. He always made everybody, waitresses and assemblymen and directors, um, he always made them feel really important. And I, I just wanted to share that, so thank you. Do we have anybody else? Yes, please. Hi, I'm Kiara Young, and I am a member of Christ Our Hope Parish with Mr. Sweeney, and he always brought joy wherever he was. And one of the times that I can account for this is my sisters and I, Irish dance, and he, one day at church, he was like, hey, do you girls want to come dance with my daughters at our little Irish celebration at um, the Italian Fisherman at BMS Pay Pops? And it was a great opportunity. And when I was dancing on that stage, I looked out at him in the crowd and he just had this wide smile on his face that just compelled me to joy. And I think it's great because every single time I saw him I was like, oh Mr. Sweeney, this cute old man, and I love him. I just wanted to go give him a hug every time. And it was just, it was so nice and so generous and he shared everything, including all his emotions. And I just really want to account for that. So, thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to say a few words? Yes, please. please. My name is Don Artico, and I'm a parishioner at uh, Christ of Hope Parish. But you know, in life, how sometimes we don't know. You know, someone passes, you don't know, and you're wondering. Well, I had a wonderful experience with Clayton. I believe it was the ninth of the month before he passed away. Uh, we were in Bemis. Susan was I was picking her up from rug hooking, and he came across the street. He'd been for lunch, I believe, and we got talking. I said, Clayton, would it be a time? Would you like to come over? to church some Sunday, uh, maybe when we have breakfast, the first Sunday of the month we have breakfast there. And he said, you know, I'd love to do that. And that's how I all remember Clayton. And so I figured the next month when it came up, I would, uh, I said to Susan, you know, we need to call Clayton. And unbelievable, I didn't realize at the time he was seriously ill at the time. And uh, then the following Monday, I hear that he had passed and said, Susan, that's how I will always remember Clayton. Very upbeat, and he was glad to come over with us. And I'm just so fortunate to have that memory of Clayton, because so often with people, you know, somebody passes you didn't see him the last time you don't remember, but I always remember Clayton. He was just a wonderful human being. And thank you very much. Yes, please, come on down. My name is uh, Levi Swanson. I'm the assistant general manager at the Italian Fisherman and the, the executive assistant to Venus Bay Pops. So, uh, you know, I just want to speak uh, about how, how we love Clayton. I've known him since 2007. And he really was, you know, I, I'm glad that you loaned us to him because he was a part of our family too. Uh, we saw him pretty much every day in the summer. And uh, when he came in to, to, the, to the fish, he, he never demanded respect, but he commanded it just by walking in his room, his stature his character and just how a profound gentleman he was. And uh, the only thing, I, I'm just going to say one thing, is I remember a couple of years ago was late September, early October, and it was a cold, very cold day, and it was raining. And it's just one of those days where Bemis rolls up the streets and no one's in town. 
and we had like eight employees working and no customers. And I called up to Dan Delper, the, the owner, and I said, Dan, I think we should close. There's, you know, it's 7.30, no one's here. And he said, we can't close yet. Clayton has had dinner yet. So, <laughs> but uh, but uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to say uh, from the Italian Fishman and Bemis Bay Pops, uh, we're glad that uh, he was a member of our family. We're, we're honored to have known him, and I'm honored to have called him a friend. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, please. I had no intention of doing this, so bear with me. Um, my, name's <laughs> my name's Thomas. I'm one of the grandkids. I was the one who worked at the Fisherman. Um, I spent a summer with my grandfather. And anyone you ask will tell you that he was convinced he raised me because of that summer. <laughs> <laughs> and while I think I have to give credit to that to my parents, really, um, <laughs> He, he taught me a lot. Um, he, he taught me to break the rules. <laughs> he, uh, every time you were driving down the highway and someone would pass you, he would tell you, it's not worth driving that fast. You'll get there five minutes later. And then for the rest of the drive, he'd point out every single speed trap and say, that's where they get you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, he taught me to also not show all your cards um, but he he would always get on my case he would he would get me when we were in the car he'd drive me to the fisherman to drop me off at work and in the car in the middle of the summer he'd go on my case Thomas you got to get your grades up Thomas calls and beat middle of July and I'm like okay um, <laughs> but he was uh, he was always incredibly humble and this that was another thing at the fisherman he would he he was a vip table and i was i remember working there as a bus boy and they would say we have a vip table coming in and then he'd come in and sit down and i was like <laughs> okay um and i think i'm sort of reiterating things that a lot of people have said um but He was always humble and quiet, but at the same time incredibly strong. And he taught me so much, and I'm incredibly thankful to him. And in May, I'm graduating um, from Allegheny College. Um, Um, and so, he, he won't be there to graduate. <laughs> but the, the one thing that he did really leave me <laughs> um, is, is this incredible family that people have constantly talked about all day. Um, and... My family will be there to see me graduate, and I know how much it would have meant to him. And I'm just incredibly thankful to him for the family that he's left me, and that he, he gave me my entire life. And thank you. to invite Tara to come forward for a message from the family. Yeah. So I'd like to just say ditto and sit back down, but um, there's actually a few things I want to clear up about what people have said before I do that. Um, first thing is, there have been a number of people who use the word quiet 
when it came to my dad. Um, I think that um, anyone who watched a Steeler game with him would never in a million years use the word quiet to um, talk about him. Um, my children, I live in Buffalo, New York, and my children um, are actually Steeler fans and not Bills fans. Um, and we will often be sitting at parties where we're watching football happen and someone will say something kind of loud or, you know, kind of in reaction to what's happening on the screen and my kids are all, and everyone maybe jumps at that or whatever and all of my kids just sort of look and say, that's nothing. Like, you should hear my dad. Um, so, um, Katie and Dan live right up the hill from my dad and I remember talking to um, Dan one time about a Steeler game and he said, no, I watched this one at home but I'm pretty sure I heard your dad a few times. <laughs> so, so the whole quiet thing, those who have that image may want to rethink it. Um, another thing I actually wanted to, um, Jim used the, used the word that he gave you advice at some point. Um, and I think uh, Vince actually sort of corrected that one already because I'm not sure my dad ever gave advice. My dad would tell you what he thought and then follow it up with, you know, I know you'll do the right thing. <laughs> right? <laughs> Which, you know, for whatever that means. Um, I will um, agree with Thomas that my dad always knew where all the speed traps were. Um, and pretty much could tell you that from here to Pittsburgh, but then once he was traveling the state of New York, would actually get me on the phone when I was traveling for the Red Cross and say, remember, there's usually a cop sitting right here, you know, <laughs> near Albany or something like that. So um, the other thing that I want to say um, is that Andy, it was actually never a secret that he gave to Republicans. Um, when we were young, my mother was a staunch Democrat, my father was a staunch Republican, and voting day, whatever election it was, was one of the most important days of the year because they both had to get there because they canceled each other out. <laughs> and they couldn't, in a million years, let one or the other win. So they always had to go to cancel each other out. Um, world events intervened there for a while, um, and my dad was, um, known to vote Democrat sometimes, mostly after my mother died because he didn't really want her to know that it was happening. Um, but um, but um, so it, he's sort of done both throughout his life. So you don't have to hide in the shadows anymore. We're well aware of these things. Um, and then the final thing um, to uh, say before I actually say what I came up here to say, um, my dad, um, someone was telling the story, I guess it was Vince, about um, my dad's interaction with a nun. Um, we grew up going to a Catholic school run by nuns. Um, uh, some of the most difficult nuns I've ever come across in my life <laughs> in this, this school. Um, but my dad was constantly working with nuns. And um, I've never seen him cower when a priest comes in and says something or a bishop or anybody of high rank in the male part of the church, nuns could make him cower in the corner for some reason. <laughs> that good Catholic guilt really came from those nuns. So I had also seen him cower towards nuns. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to clear all that kind of stuff up before I went on. Um, my dad, uh, my mom died nine years before my dad did. Um, they had been coming to the lake every summer or every weekend and spending a great deal of every summer here prior to my mom's death. And um, it became, he, he called it the Chautauqua disease. On Friday mornings, he would start to feel very, very ill while he sat at his desk. And he would call my mother at about 10.30 and she would pick him up around noon every Friday and he would take sick leave, quote unquote, for the rest of the afternoon and he would come up to the lake. Um, when my mom died, um, this community, um, St. Isaac Jogues in particular, they were, um, he was still going there routinely, um, and people on the street, people he was connected with, um, really helped him survive my mother's death. He told me when he decided to move here from Pittsburgh, he said, at my stage of life, he had friends who were dying, he had friends who were moving to um, Florida, warmer areas, um, and he said in Pittsburgh, um, he still had his sisters, which whoever said that that had to be tough to have six sisters, I think it was until the day he died, still a little tough to have six sisters. Um, but he said, I have my sisters 
in Pittsburgh, but I have acquaintances in Pittsburgh. A lot of people know me there. What I have in Bemis is friends. And he truly, truly believed that. And that was the guiding force for him to move up here, was here he felt connected to people. And everybody has spoken to that. Um, and I think that that's an important thing um, for us to remember. His sisters are still annoyed that he moved from Pittsburgh. Um, but I don't think that they really got a chance to see this and to talk to people who really were friends with him up here. Um, the way, before my mom died, my mom was the person we would talk to when we called. We called, we all live far from um, my parents and my mom is the one who would talk to us. She'd find out all the news, um, she'd give us news from other people. Um, and if we did talk to my dad, it was a very short phone call um, or short conversation. After my mom died, that had to change. Um, and there were certain things that we realized um, when we would go to call my dad. Um, first and foremost is that you never called during a Steeler game. Um, unless you actually had a question about a call. He loved those <laughs> phone calls. Um, you, um, you never called, he knew more about what would impact the Steelers in terms of wins and losses and all of that kind of stuff than anybody I knew. So you had to be really careful when you called because if there was a team that would win or lose and that could some point in the future in the playoffs impact the Steelers, you didn't want to interrupt that game either. Um, you didn't want to call during March Madness, during all the basketball games. Um, he watched every single basketball game during March Madness. Um, if there were important college bowl games on, football games, you didn't call at those times. Um, so clearly there were things that he prioritized. We've talked a lot about family, but there were things that he prioritized over family when you had those phone calls, right? Um, and that was really a lesson that we as children learned that we needed to be able to focus on things that were important to us. Um, the list of what really impacted when we called my dad grew a lot in the last five years. So you wouldn't call on a Friday night because you knew he was going to be out to dinner. You wouldn't call um, on a Monday because you knew he would be at Rotary. You wouldn't call when you knew that there was a Red Cross thing going on. You wouldn't call on Sunday mornings or um, at the last few um, months at least, Saturday afternoons when he would go to Mass. Um, if there was a Jackson Center event, you wouldn't call. That whole week of the humanitarian discussions, um, we couldn't get a hold of him that whole week. <laughs> Um, if there was a POPs event going on, we couldn't call during that. Um, so there were a lot of things that became very, very important to him that really impacted his life, but also ours when we would call, and that's how we really knew what was important to my dad. When we would get him on the phone, um, he would tell us um, about life up here, um, initially starting with what he'd eaten the last day because he was always going somewhere to a restaurant and he would tell us what he'd eaten, but more importantly, he would tell us who was there with him or who he saw. And sometimes those lists were really long of who he ran into when he happened to be at the Italian Fisherman. Um, and he would talk about how all these people that he had talked to. And that really spoke to how he, um, what he valued in this community was the people that he would come in contact with. Um, so he loved the lake. Um, he loved um, us being on the lake. He actually told me one time when my children were young um, and I had them out on the boat that um, he was terrified of water. Um, it was something that um, he tried really hard our whole lives to not let us know because he didn't want us to be terrified of water. Um, but it says a lot that he enjoyed us and our children on the water enough to buy a house on a lake. It's kind of crazy for a guy who doesn't like water. Um, but he loved the lake, and he loved the people here. Um, and clearly, you guys loved him. And I think it was that combination. Um, I think we're here to celebrate his life, but I think what that means is that we're here to celebrate friends and family. And in this room, there's a whole lot of crossover in that. Um, friends became family to him. Um, and that's really important. And he made sure that when we were here, we became friends with his friends. Um, and so that leaves us with a whole lot 
when we walk away from here. Um, so from the family, I want to thank you guys all for not only coming today and sharing incredible memories and laughs and, and um, thoughts about our father, um, but also being there for the last um, 30 years, really, but in particular the last um, few years to help take care of him as he did start to decline. That means a lot to us as a family. Um, so I thank you for all of that. Um, one public service announcement, we have lunch downstairs. Um, there is a ton of it, so please stay. Like we might actually bar the door so that you have to eat before you leave. There's that much food. Um, we also have a book downstairs that we'd love to have you just sign into so that we know who is here. And um, there are prayer cards and pictures of my father downstairs that are available, available for anybody to take. Um, so um, please feel free to do that. Um, and again, thank you for being here today. Thank you for um, loving and caring for both of my parents, but in particular my father. I want to thank Tara and the family for inviting me to be here, part of this. And this week when my staff, I reminded them I was coming here, they were reflecting on the wonderful and the blessed opportunity they had at the end of his life. Evidently, the family home is not well heated when it gets really cold. And so anyways, we, my secretary, Doris, got me on the phone and said, you got to convince Clayton to come here now. And so he did come and we got to break bread and have a meal with him and they really appreciate that. And that's what we do in our faith. The most important thing we do is have that meal, that sacred meal that we celebrate the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as I close in prayer, I would like to read from sacred scripture. This is from the book of Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what was planted, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather their stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time for war and a time for peace. God has made everything beautiful in its time. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the time you have given us with our brother Clayton. The gifts that he gave us, the laughs, the tears, the challenges, and all that he has meant for us. We ask you, dear Father, to have that spirit of Clayton in our hearts through that Holy Spirit that you give all of us so that we may continue on to show his love that he had for others and the love of life and the courage to continue to bring into this world your beauty and your kingdom, Lord God. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Most of us were only honored to know Clayton and to be a part of his life in the last few years of his life. And the things that we saw and the things that he did during those last few years, it is just uh, to think about that through a whole lifetime and to think about his impact on so, so many people during that lifetime is just... Uh, you know, it's just amazing. There's no other way to describe it. It is just amazing. And he indeed was a miracle. And as we've all pointed out here today, we were so honored and blessed to be a part of his life for the time that we could be. Thank you all for coming. Again, please join us downstairs. We join the family downstairs for a lunch catered by Guppy's Restaurant. And I saw many, many wonderful looking desserts coming through the door as everybody came in. And so again, we're gonna lock the doors until all that food is gone. And so please join us. Don't forget to sign the guest book. And thank you very, very much for coming. <laughs>